And in this address, I want to talk about two things, I suppose, in the latitude of, of the address. And mostly I'd like to give some thoughts around pastoral renewal and how we do it in New Zealand. And then I'd like to conclude with some remarks as sort of the outgoing president of the NZGA. Pasture underpins what we do in New Zealand. We know our climate gives us our competitive advantage. And part of maintaining that pasture base is regrassing or renewal. And when I talk about renewal in this presentation, I'm not going to be talking about regrassing. By renewal, I mean addressing the underlying reasons for a poor performance of a pasture, whether it be soil fertility or pests or whatever. So we have an annual investment in this country of over $300 million a year into renewal. So it's pretty serious. Um, and this is assuming some figures from the Pasture Renewal Charitable Trust, about 8% of dairy farm area, about 2.3% of sheep. Um, sheep is significantly lower because of the hill and high country. And looking at about an $800 a hectare figure for renewal. Often, often greater, but let's sort of back of the envelope cut stuff, let's look at 300, three, uh, sorry, $800 a hectare. So it was about 300 plus million, so it's serious. And there's a lot of information available, and if you look through the grasslands and other proceedings on the physical aspects of renewal, things like herbicide use, sowing methods, sowing depth, there's a few papers on sort of how we actually set these renewal decisions. And sort of a lot of this thinking today came through a project we started a thing called Grass into Gold a few years ago with a group of dairy farmers, which has morphed into Tillatalk with Dairy NZ, um, very, very, uh, uh, very nice for them to take it on and continue the program. And the big question we were getting from, from dairy farmers is, well, how much renewal should I be doing? Am I doing good renew? I, you know, everyone does this renewal stuff, so I just do it. So there were some real questions, and what's come out of a bit of thinking and whatever, we found we could start doing a lot better decisions. Um, we need to do some different thinking on renewal, we need to use some of our current technologies differently and capture some of the renewal planning into some of the new technologies that are coming through on the horizon. And this is the challenge I put today on this part of the talk about renewal. There are about five drivers on renewal, you could argue. Crop requirement, so you need a winter crop or a summer crop, so that drives renewal. Or historic. And I often come across farmers that say, oh, we do two paddocks every year. It's in the budget. So we always do two paddocks. They might need to do one paddock or no paddocks or six paddocks. I don't know, but they do two paddocks. Event response for pugging or um, flood or whatever. The fourth is for development of a farm. But the fifth is the one I wanted to focus on, which is sort of the cost benefit side of renewal. And I'd say few commercial farms we've worked with sort of have any sort of structure around cost benefit of renewal and how you actually do it. And that's the focus of this talk. So how could this work? Well, I've got a couple of examples of a couple of dairy farms we've, we've been working with. Um, the principles hold for sheep and beef farms is exactly the same. It's just dairy farms are a lot simpler when it comes to working on this sort of area. Fewer mobs of stock. So here's a, an analysis of the Marlborough Monitor Farm. This is run by Jason and Amber Templeman. And uh, this information is the annual pasture performance across the property, paddock by paddock. Done the same as a feed wedge, so we've ranked it from the highest to the lowest. And it's similar to a feed wedge, but it's just the production over a year. So tons of dry matter per hectare grown. This can be done, as this case, from weekly farm walk records and back calculated, or we can do it from grazing records, and there's other ways to do it. The reason I'm pretty excited about this is you get a pretty good look at the potential for missing yield. And on most farms we look at, there's a huge potential for missing yield. And 
We've just done this by taking, hey, what's the best paddock on the farm? Well, that's potential of yield, so let's move that across and let's look at, say, all the paddocks could be like that. There's a lot of noise and error around this, and as a general rule, anything two tonnes, we've ignored. Starts getting up to about three tonnes difference, we start getting interested, because there is a lot of noise in farm systems. The first question I've always asked when I ask this, and the farmers look at this sort of analysis, is, well, how hard should I chase this? Right? Should I be doing six paddocks or two paddocks, or stick with what I've got budgeted? And that's what we tried to answer. This analysis leads you to, in this case, we should renew paddock B22. Remember the B22, because I'll come back to it. This paddock B22 that's got a potential of about eight and a half tonnes. But of course, all paddocks are not the same. So what we've done is divide the farm in productive types. And there's nothing in the software or automated systems that do this at the moment. And in fact, you can see that now B22, right at the right-hand end, is not very interesting in terms of renewal because it's actually summer dry country on this monitor farm and it's got about a one and a half ton production potential and not worth chasing. And as usual with farms, the low hanging fruit is the poorest performers on the best part of the farm. I just, just want to ask in the audience to show of hands, has anyone seen a farmer do this sort of analysis? We've got one over here. Cool, I'll be talking to you later. Because it's, it's, this is the question we're being asked all the time. And this sort of data is there, right? It's sitting in the system, so we're just not analysing it and using it. I'm going to take you a little scenario on typical renewal, and a lot of the decisions I've seen, and, and um, as Warren said, I've spent over 30 years in the industry from the age of six. <laughs> and a lot of the decisions around renewal in my career is a farmer goes around with a company person around the farm looking for paddocks to renew. It's a nice day, it's usually dry, it's the autumn, and the amount of renewal has been predetermined for either the amount of crop or it's in the budget, those reasons one, two, before. So they drive to several paddocks and they have a look and they generally agree, yes, this looks like a good paddock for renewal. The question I have is are we under choosing underperforming paddocks or just ugly ones? I make these comments a rather tongue in cheek as many farmers do have a pretty good feel for their property, they're smart people. But I assure you they do have um, some validity. I've been on farms where we've done this analysis and we've carefully inspected the best performing paddocks and the poorest performing paddocks and visually could not tell them apart. Okay? We knew completely divergent performance, but the same similarly ryegrass density, weed density, whatever. Very hard to tell things visually from one-off expression. And the other thing is I remember a challenge to a very good farmer, and he is a very good farmer, and you'd recognise his name, and he did this paddock analysis because I challenged him to, and he rang me up the next day because he was taken aback, and he was very excited because he'd chosen six paddocks to renew, and five of them we're in the top third of his farm's production. And he was absolutely blown away that he had made completely the wrong decisions. He had chosen paddocks he didn't like, um, and they were actually performing really well. He liked them a lot more after that. In fact, he didn't renew those ones. So there's some good work to be done. And the other thing to do when you start collecting this information, and we can automate it and put it into our systems, is you can look at success or not. So with the Link University Dairy Farm, we've done this every year, and this is the one for the Link University Dairy Farm. There the productive units are the soil types. It's all irrigated, it's flat, it's all really good fertility, um, but it's amazingly effective even on a beautiful flat Canterbury pivot irrigated farm. 
that the Tamuka soils are just sort of almost dirt. They are uh, not good at all. Amorphous clays. And they just don't have the production of the other ones. But the exciting thing about Lincoln is this graph. And um, if you can understand this, you're doing well. It's a bit hard to see, but we've been analysing the paddock performance for 14 years on Lincoln. as a pretty neat data set there. And on the right of the graph, you'll see all the different years, the slightly different colours. 2005, 6 through to 1819. The red events are the renewal. So hard to see here, but I can tell you that what we do from this is get a cost benefit. We get some idea as are we actually getting a benefit after the renewal event? If we aren't, we got problems. If we are, we can at least do a cost benefit. And this is helping people um, make decisions. We gave a paper in the 2000. 15 Masterton Conference, some of you may remember, on Leo Donkers. And Leo was doing 30% renewal of his property a year. And without this sort of confidence of back calculating, and in that paper in the Masterton, you'll see why he's doing it and why he found it highly profitable, because he was seeing that gain in performance. So the question I asked earlier, how hard should we chase this missing renewal? This analysis really helps. If, we're, if a farmer wants to do more renewal, we need to be confident we're getting an acceptable return. For LEDF, I can tell you, we get about a $6,500 return over five years, is how the numbers stack out on average, for about a $1,000 investment. So to conclude this first part of my address, the challenge I've given for everyone in this room because we need to collectively try and solve this and think better about it, is we, for this 300, mil, 300 plus million dollar investment in renewal and pasture we make every year, we need to get smarter, collect and use the data we have to make better decisions. We need to automate the analyses we do. And the third point, ugliness is not a good way to assess pasture. So I'd like to change tack now and just make some final remarks as the, the, the outgoing um, president after 13 years on the exec and take about five minutes. Is that about right? You have the stage. I have the stage. God, this is the first time I've got something over Warren in my life. This is a moment of glory for me. <laughs> um, we've been challenged in this conference by several of the speakers um, particularly uh, some interesting papers about linking across the value chain to our customers. And we've heard those customers are not necessarily predictable or logical. And our customers are largely global. And their views of what's acceptable in our grazing systems here are coming from a very different place for us. Whoop, what happened here? We've um, cocked up the order. Yeah, the customer is always right. And while I agree that the customer is always right, I think we also need to have a balance to this because I've spent a lot of time dealing with customers. And educating customers is absolutely critical. Their views are equally formed from what they don't know as much as what they do know. And acceptable practices for our industry, for helping educate our customers or the wider public, must be developed through good science to last. And in the digital age of communication and miscommunication, and I did give one example. That was the one last year I gave, in, uh, which was based on a study, if you remember, at the University of Alberta um, in reporting in the media. It was good science. Um, just um, they overlooked the fact that the trial was actually done with rats. Didn't actually use red wine, but a compound found in grape skins and was given in a level equivalent to us drinking 100 to 1,000 bottles a day of red wine. And while humorous was a sad commentary on it. But this sort of thing happens in our global age. And I would say the need 
for peer review, independent status of the association is now more important than ever. It is unique within the space in our industry. I would thank you very much to our family of sponsors who recognise this and support us. We work in a great industry. Grazing pasture is natural. Animals have done it for millions of years. And natural food will always be the most sought after. We have a great, unique association that's been 88 years in the making, has a positive, passionate, as well as friendly culture, and it's probably our overseas visitors to the conference and the envy they have of this association that probably reminds us what exactly we have. So lastly, to conclude, to everyone here, I ask you to continue supporting the New Zealand Grasslands Association and the role it has in our industry. So thank you very much. <laughs>